Your axe digs deeply into the tree. The screaming begins. Roll for saves. This is Roll for uh, Hi, let's try that again. This is Roll for Saves, episode six. And no cuts, no edits, and just go with all the mistakes. So today's going to be different. I have been doing the story for what, five sessions. And I promise I want to get into the game design a little bit, but I haven't really done that so much. So that's what we're going to do today is get into the game design behind Roll for Saves. Um, so Roll for Saves, uh, I had some design priorities, uh, my, my design goals and what my goals were uh, included. Uh, I wanted to use many of the dice d12 uh, d12 d8 d6 etc i wanted to uh limit the probabilities sorry i got a little bit of a clacky keyboard i'm not sure if it's going to show up in the um recording or not i'm trying new software as well we're we'll see how it works i was having a problem with um zoom losing track of my microphone i don't know why this computer gets weird um i, I was I began recording everything with, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, I began editing uh, everything with Audacity because I was just doing sound for a while, um, trying to do it as a podcast, just strictly as a podcast. And the sound files um, or the Audacity quit opening, just randomly quit opening. And I tried uninstalling, reinstalling, tried installing different forks of Audacity because it's open source, so there's different forks of it out there. And nothing worked. Nothing would open. Um, so gave up on that. Um, luckily, I found a, a web service that I can use for, you know, editing audio files a little bit. Um, but then Zoom just started losing track of my microphone, and I'd get all these errors while I was trying to record. So this is the third or fourth time I've started this podcast, this episode. Um, we'll see how it goes. So far, this software is working well. It is Gamecaster, the free version. There's a watermark down here, but I don't think you can see it because right now it's just a white screen. Um, probabilities, which I cannot spell. Probabilities. Oh, that doesn't look right, but oh well. Um, and then what else do we have? We want to have... Um, I want to track pass and fail, of course. And also I want to track uh, progress and damage. And also I wanted to have a static process, um, meaning I want the same process for nearly everything in the game. So one more time, I wanted to have many different sizes of dice. Um, I figured I've I've invested in buying a whole bunch of different weird funky dice. I want to use them. And I mean weird and funky as in it's out of the D6 context. Um I wanted to limit the probabilities. Um this is kind of like uh D and D fifth edition. They wanted to get into what is it, bounded probabilities. I can't remember exactly what they call it, where you're you're limited by uh, how much bonus you can uh, a character can accumulate um, is limited by the mechanics of the game, and so that's I wanted that I wanted to be a of course track pass or fail because that's a big part of any role playing game, and I wanted to track progress and damage, and I wanted to have a static. Uh, I wanted to process the processes to be static, meaning um, pretty much the same process for everything that you're doing um i did add a little tweak to it for magic just to make magic have a different feel um but i haven't tested it that much so i'm not sure if i'm going to use it um i'm going to try to get jfing to use magic soon we'll, we'll see how that goes um so those are my goals and my inspiration started with um truthfully it started with uh ICRPG, uh, index card 
RPG. If you just look up ICRPG, you'll find it. It's out there. It's cool. Um, the this system has a cool thing where the the TN the target number is set per scene. So uh, characters come into the scene. The GM tells them, okay, this scene everything is target number fifteen. Um, and then they go into a, a more difficult scene. Okay, now every, the target number is 18 for everything you do. Try to hit something, try to open a lock. Everything you do is the same target number in that scene. And so if they're in an easy scene, the low target numbers, fighting the big bad in boss, they're, they got a, a higher target number. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And then a lot of narrative games will have a static like well not really st static if if they're using let's back up games like apocalypse Wor world have static target numbers where if you get a nine or higher you have one result if you have 10 or higher you have another result right i think it's seven and nine or seven and ten in apocalypse world and then dice pool games have it where you want to get a certain number on the die and then you have a success. Um, so those are fairly static and I like that. And then I read Nave, which is another really cool game. And Nave, it has, it has two different sets of target numbers. It has contested role target numbers, which is your, the, the foe you're rolling against they have a defense number, so you have to beat their defense number. Um, but everything else, um, the target number is always going to be 16. And uh, who is it that wrote Nave? I think that's Ben Milton. Um, but he mentioned that the reason why he chose that was um, if you have zero bonus, you have a 25% chance of success. If you have zero bonus. And then if you... The maximum bonus is 10 and so then if you have max bonus then you have a 75% uh, chance of success um, and that's that max bonus and I was looking at the numbers and it, it felt good um you know 25% chance it, it sounds like it's harsh but generally if the players can talk their way into bonuses, right? This this makes it more of a, a narrative, right? They're like, oh man, I only got a 25% chance of success. Like, okay, well, what can you do to get a bonus, right? You know, talk to me. What what do you have in your equipment? What are your, your abilities? What can you do? Um, So th this can get a little conversation going. So I'm okay with having a low probability. And so, again, it has a max bonus in it. So it has the the no bounds set um, on how far the probabilities can go. And I want to do something similar with it. So um, I was playing around looking at probabilities and I realized that um, with the D4, if you're looking at a target number, if I set the target number of four on a D4, then the D4, you have 25% chance of hitting four or higher. If I have a D6, I have a 50% chance. If I have a D8, I have, oh, what is it, 62, 62.5%. Uh, D10, 70%. And then D12, 75%. Right, so this gets us the same range of success, 20, 25 to 75. And I was like, those numbers work well for Nave. Um, Nave's really popular. I guess people feel comfortable with those numbers. Uh, some people say for games, they try to get like a 60% chance of success and players feel it's fair. Um, but I think that's more for narrative games in my experience. So I, I was looking at this range. I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Um, But what if I have something that's like advantage or disadvantage? You know, how could I throw that out? And I was thinking about it, and I realized that if I start at a D6, if I start at D6, 
then I can just make my die size part of the advantage and disadvantage. And that was kind of cool. And so that became the whole, that helped inform the bonuses and everything to the role. And that's a large part of it. So let's get into the bonuses a little bit. Um, this is largely inspired by uh, Spire, The City Must Fall, and Heart, The City Beneath, both by the same game company. I've only played Spire, but I've read Heart. Um, both are awesome games. Um, they, where you get your bonuses are limited um, in different parts of the character. So you have domains. Um, and if one or both of your domains, or if you have more, you can have more than one domain. So um, if your domain, any domains match what you're doing, what you're dealing with, whatever, then you get a bonus. Um, if any of your skills match, you get a bonus. And then you get a bonus for, what is it, Max or something? I can't remember exactly what all they have. So they kind of limit where these bonuses come from, right? They set, it's like having a bucket. You can pull one bonus out of this bucket, one bonus out of another bucket. So I was looking at my dice and I was like, okay, I can have three buckets I can pull bonuses from. And so my buckets became backgrounds. Well, tab is really small here. Skills and uh, background skills and uh, easy. All right. I guess I can say we had four buckets because we also have hard, but hard is the opposite of easy. It actually is not good for the character. And so I was like, okay, what can we do with these? Um, well, backgrounds became very much like uh, Spire and Hearts domains. Um, they are external to the character. And if the character, um, if the character, it, it depends on where, who, or what the character is dealing with. Um, so a character with a background of, let's say, uh, uh, academic, an academic background, if they're in a library, they get the bonus. If they're dealing with a librarian, they'll get a bonus. If they're dealing with a book, they'll get a bonus. Um, you can kind of apply it to what they're doing. If they're researching with the book, well, there again, they're using a book. Um, if they are trying to write something that sounds like research. Yeah, maybe they're dealing with paper and pen. Um, so that's how the backgrounds work. It's more of your external. Um, and then we have skills and skills are obviously related to the internal part of the character, um, what their personal abilities are. So a character with um, skirmish skill gets into a fight, they can use their skirmish. A character with study skill tries to study. They can use a skill. They try to um, they try to to really observe something to uh, determine its purpose. They get a bonus because they're studying that thing. Um, so th this is kind of internal to the character. And then the easy and hard is kind of a mixed bag. Um, it could be related to an ability. It could be related to an item the character is carrying. It could be related to something external. Um, they have someone assisting them, perhaps. So th these together would get you up to D12. And again, hard can be mixed. Um, something might happen to the character that make their roles hard. Uh, if they have an injury and it makes sense that the injury would uh, hinder them in some way, then it can make that roll hard. If they, uh, if they're trying to climb a wall and the wall is on fire, that's going to be hard. Um, so when something's hard, it decreases the die size one size. So we start at D six and if no background, no skills and nothing makes it easy, but something makes it hard, you're going to drop down to a D uh, to a D four. If you, if your background applies, your skill applies, and something makes the roll easy, you go all the way up to D12. 
Um, and then if something's hard, you get down to a D10. And you can dip into these buckets once each. So you, no matter no, how many parts of your background would apply, you only get the bonus once from background. Um, even if two skills, because skills are kind of vague sometimes, if, they, if two skills might kind of fit into what you're trying to do, you only get the bonus one time. If multiple uh, effects would make your roll easy, you only get to be easy one time. And then no matter how many different things would make the roll hard, it only becomes hard once. And then that just sets up all the bounds, right? Um, so that, that sets up a, track, a pass and fail, fairly easy. And I wanted to define the pass and fail um, as saves. So let's get into saves a little bit. Saves. So if you play, um, if you've ever played a game and you, you make a notice check and you fail the notice check, and then everyone else at the table is like, I want to roll too, right? And then everyone rolls notice check to see if they can get anyone with a success. Or if a thief is like picking a lock and they fail the, the roll and they're like, mm, can I roll again? Right? The lock is still there. I still have my thieves tools. Can I roll again? And I wanted to set up the, the saves so that could not happen. Um, kind of get out of that uh, mode of just doing it over and over again. And I, I can't remember where I read, uh, what game was it? Maybe Nave? I can't remember where I read, but um, basically the, the, write, the writer was, or that designer was like, you know, if a character has infinite amount of ability, you know, supply or time to overcome an obstacle without risk of consequence, then it's just safe to assume that they will do it, right? Given enough time, they will figure out how to pick the lock on the door. Given enough time, they will figure out, you know, how to get over the wall. It's only when there's a risk that having a role is necessary. And this risk might be um, an immediate risk. And this is my own interpretation of it now. Um, so, you know, you, you fail to pick the lock and um, as a consequence, your tools are broken, right? You might tell the character, okay, you can pick this lock, but it's a very complicated lock and it is designed to stop thieves. If you fail your roll, it's going to snap your thieves tools. And you can tell your, the player beforehand, you know, this is, this is the possible consequence you will suffer. And um, it could be a, a consequence down the ro road. So, okay, you can try to pick the lock, but um, there's a guard coming down. There's a card coming soon. You know, there's a patrol coming soon. So you, you're only going to have, you can have maybe two tries to get through this lock. And then you, so then I need to like, have like an extended test task or something possibly. And we'll get into progress in a minute. Um, so we can set up these saves and what becomes apparent is that the consequence is more important than whether or not the character succeeds. Um, because the consequence, like just having a failure doesn't move the story, but having a consequence can move the story. Um, may not be in the story, in the direction the character wants to go in, but it does still propel the story in a direction. So I wanted to define roles as saves, um, not just as a check to see if you can do something or not. So I, deci I decided to define them as saves. And this was um, also inspired by Into the Odd, where he defines, uh, who is that? Uh, it's not Ben Milton. That's McDonald, McDowell, Chris McDowell, Chris McDowell. And he defines it as, I'm trying to do this off my head, um, any activity the character gets into that carries a risk, right? So risk, right? The consequence, that's the important part. Um, so I got into that. So 
basically what this becomes then is 75% chance of a consequence, 50% chance of a consequence, 25% chance of a consequence, right? It's just the opposite number, right? The remainder of the 100 of, you know, subtracted from 100. So into the odd was a big inspiration for this and made sense to me. And what this also does is it puts the, the success or non-success into the hands of the GM. And then the consequence or no consequence into the dice, right? And what I mean by this is in roll for saves, if a character, if a player rolls um, a three, then that is a failure, um, i.e. that's a consequence. In, in other words, that's a consequence. But if they, that three, it is a consequence, but does not mean that the character failed in the activity. So in combat, the if a player rolls a three, their character can still do three damage to a foe, but there's also going to be a consequence to the character for because they rolled a three. Um, they might take an injury if they're out of grit, for example. But the whether or not they deal that damage to the foe is kind of up to the GM. The failure of the activity, the failure of what the character is doing, may be part of the consequence. So the GM may say, okay, um, or the, the player says, okay, I, I try to hit the foe, they roll a three, the GM can say, okay, you, you hit, but you also have this consequence, right? You hit him and he hits you at the same time. Or they can say, okay, you go to hit him, but he stabs you first. And now, and that causes you to miss. So you deal zero damage and you have this. So that, that severity is up to the GM. Um, and I would balance this based on what they are encountering. Um, a, a more, um, a higher tier, a higher difficulty task, I would have heavier consequences um, applied to it versus a basic uh, task. For example, so let's say fighting again, fighting a bandit, you roll a three, sure, you also deal three damage to that bandit. Fighting a dragon, you roll a three, maybe deal zero damage. Um, and then you're going to get also burned by that dragon. So that's how the saves kind of work. Um, uh, what else do we have? So we have the three buckets. Ah, so that sets up um, the track pass and fail progress and damage. I wanted everything to be into one roll. Um, yeah, so one roll and I wanted the roll to track pass and fail and also um, progress and damage. And this was partially inspired by um, index card RPG, even though I went way out of their mechanics. And it's also inspired partially by um, Blaze in the Dark, which uses a mechanic from the Apocalypse World, powered by the Apocalypse, Apocalypse Games but I never played any of those. I just went straight into Blaze in the Dark. Um, so this is where I experienced it, but they Blaze in the Dark has the clocks and based on your roll, you can deal from zero, depending on your, what is it, position? Effectiveness, I can't remember what they call it, but you can deal, you can have zero addition to the clock or you can have, I think like up to six or something, eight, depending on, whether you're in a good position or a bad position and such. Um, the next card RPG uh, uses progress to track anything you're doing that 
is an extended task. So trying to pick a lock, it can be an extended task. You have to get 10, I think they call it effort, 10 effort to pack, pick the lock. Um, their efforts always in multiples of 10, which I, is really good. And this is, they actually explained this is why they did it. Um, Hank, Hank, I can't remember his name. I think he uses a pseudonym. Hank Hernan, Hernan, Hank Hernan. He, yeah, he's on YouTube, um, Rune, Rune Hammer Games. Um, but he explains that the uh, jumping by multiples of 10 means that every addition of 10, that's a that feels stronger to the characters. If the character's dealing more, they like if they get more hit points and it's always multiples of 10, they like if I get one hit point, nah. If I get 10, wow, I now have twice as many hit points as I did before. Um, but then if they're fighting a, a monster, the monster has 10 hit points, another monster has 11, not much of a difference. If you go from 10 to 20, now we're in a whole different ball game, right? Now we have a reason to have a difference. Um, and I thought that was pretty good reasoning. And I wanted it to be more than just the narrative. Um, you, you, you failed, you have zero uh, progress, you you have a mixed success, you have one progress, you have a full success, you have two progress, you have a critical success, you have four progress or whatever it is. Um, so I wanted to have more variable progress, but I did not want it to be in two roles and uh, index card RPG keeps it in two roles. But because they do their off of a d4 for basic things uh, d8 for combat and d10 no no d6 for combat d10 i think is for magic d8 is for magic i don't remember exactly um i realized okay it doesn't have to be tied to a weapon um if i'm gonna make a variable it's okay just totally untied from weapons and in, in the earliest iterations of the game, I still had it tied to weapons. It took a long time for me to just break that habit. Um, so I, I untied it from the weapons and made it where whatever you roll, that's your progress. Your progress, your effort, um, your damage. Right, that, that's it. It's all tied up there in whatever you roll. But you can have uh, bonuses from items. And this makes items valuable. So you might be rolling a D4 on your skill because you have, or, or on your save, you might be rolling a D4 because you have no background skill or anything. Um, but you have a lot of items that will give you another plus four. So you have, you're, you're more likely to suffer a consequence, but you can have a large amount of effort still applied to the skill as long as the care, as long as the GM doesn't say you fail. Um, so I, I wanted to have that and then just wrote it up, uh, much like they have an ICRPG where yes, you can, or blaze in the dark, even where, uh, some things are extended tasks where they'll take multiple roles. Um, but I try to also explain it as in, um, there needs to be a limit on the number of roles and a consequence for not reaching that limit. And then it's up to the GM, um, whether or not there's going to be minor consequences for failing the saves because each role is still a save. Um, so there might be minor consequences due to the save, such as lost progress, um, loss of materials, uh, that sort of things. All right, so that's progress and uh, everything. Like I said, I just want to be a static, static process. So rolling initiative is the same thing. Um, making a combat roll is the same thing. Making a skill check, everything is the same. And to show this, let's get into combat just a little bit. So combat, um, just like many other games, it starts with initiative and then we get into um, attacks, but this one has a GM round, which is weird. So it all starts with initiative. Initiative is a save. The consequence, 
you go after the GM, right? If you fail the save, the GM will get a turn before you do. And on the player's turns, they can do whatever they want. Um, everything's gonna be the same target number, whether they're in combat or not. The combat might make certain things hard if is you know they're taking damage or or whatever. Um, you know, of course, it's up to the GM if it's going to be hard or not. But the the um, it, it just it runs the same, right? There might be a consequence, might not be, whatever. So you roll a save at the beginning of the round. Um, you either go uh, PCs first, PCs uh, pass, and then we have GM's round, and then the PCs that failed the, the initiative save um so they just they do what they want to for their action it goes to the gm's turn gms have a a special event they deal with um well let, let me get back to the pc's role i just i just realized what i wanted to say about that pc rolls um in combat if they uh fail the save then the gm can always say you take damage, right? You, you're, you're, you're being targeted by whatever they're fighting by the foe. Um, and that could cause them to lose grit or take injury or whatever the GM wants to incorporate into their description. Um, so the, it's easy to make a consequence in combat, right? Injury, damage, whatever is always on the table. On the GM's turn, um, it's a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. The GM rolls a die based on the round that you're in. So the first round is a D4, second round is a D6, D8, D10, D12. And then depending on the result of the die, um, you have different things that occur within the, the combat. And this gave me a table, or I used a table one through three, um, base damage, uh, four through four, five, six would be, uh, special ability. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is environmental. And then 10 plus is base damage and special ability. All right, sorry if I got misspellings in there. Yeah, there is a spelling there. Okay, so this base table, one through three, four through six, seven through nine, 10 plus is the way that I try to make most tables go th the follow. Um, if it's two numbers added together, then it's gonna be uh, two through four, whatever, right? So everything's gonna be plus one up higher. Um, so basically, if you're rolling a D4, you have 75% chance of getting base damage, 25% chance of a special ability. D6, 50-50, D8, you're getting to environmental a little bit. D10, you have 10% chance of having base damage and a special ability. D12, you got a higher chance, a uh, 25% chance of having base damage and special ability. And what these are, base damage is uh, all the PCs and their allies, whatever, within the combat lose a grit um, or two grit, right? A small amount of grit. Um, if they're at zero grit, then there's no effect. They just, they've, have, they've already lost a grit, it's fine. Um, special ability is more focused damage. Um, this can cause an injury or it can simply just reduce grit if they still have grit available. Um, environmental, this can make it where it is hard for a PC to attack a foe um, or they might take more damage if they fail uh, or the, the somehow the, the battlefield has changed so maybe they are now far from the foe. So if they don't have a ranged weapon, then they have to spin a move, uh, spin around moving towards the foe. So this, you know, it could be changed. Um, it could also be reinforcements coming in. 
or the foe running away, um, something of that nature, right? Whatever the GM feels fit, uh, feels like it is appropriate. Base damage and special ability, that means both happens. Base damage occurs first, um, reducing grit, and then the special ability comes in, uh, meaning if you lose base damage and takes it down to zero grit, the special ability may cause you to uh, take an injury. All right. Um, and then, so that's all on the GM's turn. So it's all yellow together. And then the next turn, next is the PCs that failed the roll. Um, and that means that they may take an injury before it's even their turn. And that's all that means. And, or it might mean the environment is changed before they can take their turn. If it's up to round, uh, three, yeah, if, if it's up to round three, then the environment might change before they can take their turn. Um, so I thought that was fairly elegant for an initiative. And then by applying it to every round, every initiative is re-rolled. So some, some rounds, maybe the GM goes before all the PCs. Other rounds, the PCs all go before the GM. Um, some things might happen and start making the initiative difficult. Um, maybe, the, maybe the GM says, okay, the room's getting filled with smoke. The initiative is hard. but maybe nothing else is hard. All right, um, we're gonna go a little bit over today. Uh, sorry about that. We are at 36 minutes. So I want to jump into grit real quick. Um, it might be questionable while I'm calling things grit, but I'll get into it. Um, into the odd again, into the odd. Great game, I suggest it. Um, into the odd, Electric Bastion Land, two very good games. Uh, mostly the same, uh, what do you call it? System, mostly the same game system. Um, some little tweaks here and there, but both are very great. Um, so grit into the odd uses, uh, HP, they call it hit protection. And this is basically, uh, a, a, a buffer before you start taking injury in combat and, even um, even the creator, um, Chris McDowell, has difficulty not calling it hit points. Um, and when you say hit points, everyone thinks, oh, health points. You know, because that's what you have in video games, right? You get zero hit points, you die. So that's what everyone expects. Um, but Into the Odd is very different because you, you get down to zero hit points or hit, hit protection. You get down to zero HP. And then you, uh, what do you have? You get down to zero HP and then you roll for scars. And then different, you know, there are like 12 level, levels of scars you can get, something like that. I can't remember exactly. Um, and I like that. It's, it's, it's very elegant. It gives that, that nice buffer and everything. I wanted something similar. So what I did was I wanted to have grit and I wanted grit to be fairly low number. Um, character creation is maximum six, but in the game you can get up to 12 grit. Yay. Um, so you have grit. And then I also wanted to have armor. Of course, because games usually have uh, some sort of combat or something. So armor uh, can get up to like six, I believe. Um, I'm not sure I actually have a limit in the game yet. I'm thinking six or so is going to be the limit. And then you add them together and that's going to give you your defense. And the way I wanted to run this, um, the way they do it into the odd, very elegant, is your hit protection gets knocked down to zero or gets knocked down or whatever. As long as you're not depraved after you take De deprived, not depraved. As long as you're not deprived, um, when you take a break, you you uh, regain all of your hit protection. And so I like that idea. Um, it, it keeps the game moving forward um, and makes having a low amount not seem too punishing. So I went with grit, um, and grit is a measure of uh, your ability to avoid getting hit 
your ability to, um, again, your, your defense is your armor, right? It could be your toughness. Um, I remember the Palladium role-playing game, they have roll with punches was a, was a skill you can have. And if you succeed on that roll, then you have the damage coming in. Um, so it's your, your ability to roll with a punch, so to speak. Um, or just your toughness, right? You're, you're, you're part turtle. You're, you have this tough, scaly skin. You get hit and you're just like, yeah, it doesn't hurt me that bad, right? Um, so that's your grit. But you're going to get worn down as the combat goes. Um, so if it ever hits zero, then you have a chance to hit. Um, if it gets down to zero, I'm going to put zero here, you have a chance to take an injury. And then injuries um, stack up. We haven't really seen injuries in the game yet, um, but they stack up. If you ever get like level five injury, you know, anything past level four, um, then your character is lost. You, you just characters like dead. Maybe you can make another action in that scene or something, but your character's gone. And then let's say you have an injury, but then you get healed. You, you have healing. Um, depending on what your highest level of injury was when you uh, completed the healing, and I'll get healing in a different video, um, you can then possibly increase your grit possibly lower your grit it depends on what you roll um so it makes having injuries actually a little beneficial because it might strengthen your character um so that's that's the way grit works and i wanted to get into that because we touched we touched on grit just a little bit in the last episode where jafing had a fight and jafing lost i think a grit due to a base ability um to base damage so it lost, I think it was one grit, but it's just going to bounce back. It's not a big deal. Um, there was no injury. The, the, it was a very quick combat. Um, not, not a big deal. So, yeah, I just wanted to touch on what grit was because of that. All right. Um, I think that's going to do us for today. We went about 12 minutes over what I usually do. Um, so this is it. I'll do, I'll get back into the story with, uh, episode number seven. Um, until then, play games and have fun. Bye.